Hey man, well, it's going to be back on the radio again today. This is the Barrett Shore Baptist Church broadcast. We certainly are privileged to be the pastor there, Brother Tim Krotz. We thank you so much for taking time to listen to our broadcast on a weekly basis. That is a great blessing to us. We're extremely thankful for the many folks that we hear from uh, on a weekly basis that listen to our broadcast as well. And we do hope that we can be a help and a blessing to you today. We are the pastor, as I mentioned, of the Barrett Shore Baptist Church located in Cana, Virginia. I realize that many of you who listen to our broadcast do not live in an area near our church, but should you be traveling through sometime, or even if you do live in the area, you're looking for a good church to visit or to attend, our church is located at 100 Born Again Lane in Cana, Virginia. We have Sunday school on Sunday mornings at 10 o'clock, our morning service, worship service at 11, our evening service has been moved to 2 o'clock in the afternoon. We have an afternoon service at 2 p.m. now instead of the usual 6 p.m. time. And our Wednesday night service is at 6.30. We'd be delighted to have you come and visit with us anytime that you possibly can. If you can't do that, please visit our church website, baritualbaptistchurch.com. On the church website, there are sermons preached by myself, our assistant pastor, Brother Kyle Hillman, and others as well that visit our church. I'm sure those sermons will be a blessing and a help to you. Well, we're going to go to the Lord in prayer this time. We're going to continue preaching from Psalm 25, which we have been doing for a good while now. And we have a few more sermons to go yet from this great psalm. So let's pray together and we'll read the first seven verses of the psalm together. And we'll share some things with you as the Lord helps us today. Father, we do love you. We do thank you for this great opportunity that you've given us to be on the radio again. I pray you would help us to be a blessing to you. I pray you'd help us to be a blessing to your people. Help us, Lord, not to waste your time or your money, but to use it in such a way that brings honor and glory to your name. And Lord, for that, we'll not fail to thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Psalm 25, the Bible says in verse number one, Unto thee, O Lord, do I lift up my soul. O my God, I trust in thee, let me not be ashamed. Let not mine enemies triumph over me. Yea, let none that wait on thee be ashamed. Let them be ashamed which transgress without cause. Shew me thy ways, O Lord, teach me thy paths. Lead me in thy truth and teach me, for thou art the God of my salvation. On thee do I wait all the day. Remember, O Lord, thy tender mercies and thy loving kindness, for they are ever, for they have been ever of old. Verse 7 says, Remember not the sins of my youth, nor my transgressions. According to thy mercy, remember thou me for thy goodness sake, O Lord. In our past sermons, the last couple of weeks in Psalm 25, we have talked about from verse number 6 on our tender mercies and the loving kindness of the Lord. There are three, there are three here in this passage. Remember, uh, there is remember thy tender mercies and thy loving kindness. Remember not the sins of my youth nor my transgression. And remember thou me for thy goodness sake, O Lord. So there's remember thy, remember not, and remember me. We've talked about already from verse number six on remembering thy tender mercies and thy loving kindness. We have talked about God's tender mercy and his loving kindness towards us. What a great blessing that is. Today, we'd like to talk about on remembering not the sins of my youth, nor my transgressions. And so verse seven, verse seven. Now let's just say uh, this at the outset of this thought. We have no record. We, we certainly know that David is the human author, the human penman of this psalm. We have no record or no indication in the Bible that David was guilty of any gross immorality or wickedness in his youth. Now, we're well aware of the sins that David committed later in life, but not in his youth. So as far as we know, as far as we have record of in the Bible, his offenses against God in his youth were probably the same that many of us or even all of us are guilty of at a young age. 
we are guilty of shortcomings. We're guilty of negligence. We're, we're guilty of ignorance. And these are certainly things to be avoided, that's for sure. But there is nothing of a vicious youth recorded against David in the word of God. But he says, remember not the sins of my youth. Now, at a young age, I realized that I was a sinner and that I needed to be saved. And I'm certain that many of you who are listening to the sound of my voice today, you realized when you were uh, at a young age, not, not all of you, but many of you, you realized at a young age that you were lost and you needed to be saved. I had the great privilege of living in a Christian home, and I had parents who were true Christians, not those who say that they're a Christian, but there's no evidence of it in their life. I know that the, the world is full of that kind of individuals and that kind of parent who makes a profession of God publicly, and they make a profession of God in church on Sunday if they are able to get there by accident. But there is no, there is no uh, life lived in the home on a day-to-day -day basis or in their lives that exemplifies what the Bible would define as being a Christian. But I had the privilege of being raised in a true Christian home with godly Christian parents. However, in spite of that <coughs> great influence and in spite of that a life of dedication to the Lord and the things of God in our home, I remember the sins of my youth. Now, just as a young child, I remember telling lies. I remember stealing on what would be considered a low scale or not even significant in the eyes of some taking cookies when I was told not to, or stealing candy when I was told I couldn't have any more, or taking a pencil at school from someone because I had forgotten mine, even cheating in school on tests or on homework assignments because I had not put forth the effort myself to learn the material at hand. And so in all of these, in all of these areas, I was disobedient not only to God, but also to my parents, because I had certainly been taught that these things were wrong. Now, you say, well, preacher, those things seem kind of innocent and uh, I, as a child, and I, I understand that to a certain degree. However, the truth of the matter is I had broken at least four of the Ten Commandments at a very early age, and I knew it, amen. And listen, if you are a young person or even an older person and you happen to realize that you're a sinner and you need to be saved, I'm glad that you can get forgiveness from God and he's the only one that can forgive, that can give the kind of forgiveness that you need as well, amen. And so the presumption here in this Psalm, David is writing this Psalm 25 the presumption is that David is no longer young when the psalm is being written. So we have this lesson that his penance and his sorrow for the sin that he has committed, and uh, they, they were for sins which were not things which were being expressed were, or, or things that were not thought of anymore, but that they were ever before him. And we read that earlier in the psalm or later in the psalm where David said, my sin was ever before me. And so these were not those type of things, but yet the sins that he had committed were things that he remembered and he remembered them for years and years after that he had committed these sins. Now we have often heard this saying, I have heard it said a couple of different ways, meaning the same thing by several different preachers or individuals over the years. And that is that, um, you can make your own choices, but you can't choose the consequences. And so you're, you're free to live the way that you want to live, but you're not free to choose the consequences for the life that you choose. Now, so look at what the Bible says in Ecclesiastes chapter 11. In Ecclesiastes chapter 11, the Bible says in verse number nine, Rejoice, O young man, in thy youth, and let thy heart cheer thee in the days of thy youth, and walk in the ways of thine heart and in the sight of thine eyes. But know thou that for all these things, God will bring thee into judgment. 
Therefore, remove sorrow from thine heart and put away evil from thy flesh, for childhood and youth are vanity. Now, David, in our psalm, he said, remember not the sins of, of my youth. So David is asking God not to remember his sins anymore. Now, I think this is real interesting. David does not ask that he might forget his own sins, but David is asking that God would forget them. Now, I, I'm not sure it would be as good for us to forget about our sins, even when they are forgiven. I'm thankful that my sins are forgiven, and there's many which I wish I could forget. But sometimes I think the remembrance of those things kind of keeps us from being involved in such things again. Now, I'm not suggesting that we dwell on our past, but I certainly haven't forgotten where he brought me from either, amen. Thank the Lord for that. Now, as far as the remembrance of sin goes, I believe there are three groups of people. I believe that the Bible teaches that there are three groups of people in regard to this remembrance of sin. First of all, there are those who have their sin in the memory of God, but not in their own memory. Now, this is a group of folks that is lost. And not only is this a group of individuals who are lost, this is a group of individuals who have no concern or no remorse because of their sinful lifestyle. These folks will never get saved until they realize that they are sinners and until they realize that there is a consequence for their sinful life. So I'll say again, the first group is those who have their sins in the memory of God, but not in their own memory. Friend, this is a dangerous place to be. If you have no thought, no conscience of your sin, no realization that there are consequences for your sinful life, then you are in danger of the wrath and the judgment of God. And so that is the first group. There is a second group, and these are those who have their sins in their own memory and in the memory of God. Now, this is not exactly the group that you want to be included in, but this is certainly a group that is better than the first group. Now, this is not a group that is not yet saved. However, this is a group that has realized that they are a sinner, and because of their sins, they are guilty before God. And because of the fact of their sins and their guilt before God, they are, they realize and recognize the fact that they are candidates for the wrath and the judgment of God. And so maybe they oftentimes an individual reaches this stage before they grow tired of their sinful lifestyle and ask Christ to save them. I remember as a young child being saved. I, I, I do not know, as I know that some say, you know, you, you have to know the, the day on the calendar and how old you were and, and all of that. I don't know any of that stuff. I know that I got saved on a Sunday morning. I know that I got saved in the springtime as far as the year is concerned. I know that I was a young man, but I am not certain of the age, probably in the neighborhood of 10 years old, I'm guessing. However, I do know that I had, before that time of salvation, I had a good while before then, had a memory of my sin. I knew that I had sinned against God. I knew that my sin had separated me from God. I knew that I was guilty of transgressing the law of God. And because of that, I was guilty before God. And I also knew that God knew that I was a sinner. I swear I'm thankful for the day that I got saved. Now, I'm not proud of this fact, but it, it is a fact nonetheless. Later on in, in life, uh, as a, later on as a teenager, I got away from the Lord I got away from my desire to serve the Lord and the things of God. I got away from church. I got away from what you would refer to maybe as religion altogether and did things, many things that I am certainly not proud of or pleased with at all. And if I could go back and live my life over, I would certainly live it in a different manner. However, 
during that time, I had a memory of my sin, and God also had a memory of my sin, and a miserable individual I was because of that sinful lifestyle. Now, there's also a third group. There is a third group in reference to this remembrance of sin. Others have their sins in their own memory, but not in God's. Boy, I am glad. I am thankful that I am in this group. Sure, I, I, even today, I am deeply saddened by some of the sinful things that I did before I was saved. I am even saddened by some of the sinful things that I have done since I have been saved. And I would be lying if I told you that I was 100% uh, pleased with the life that I am living today because I am not. There are still things that I battle with, things that I struggle with. I have a memory of my shortcomings in my life. I have a memory of the failures that I have in my life as a Christian, as a pastor, as a husband, as a father. I have made many blunders. I have had many failures. I've had many defeats. I have come short on numerous occasions. I have a memory of all of those things, and they are not without consequences, by the way. But as far as my sin is concerned, I am thankful that God does not remember those sins anymore. Now, so I am deeply saddened by some of the sinful things that I have done in my life, and especially in my youth. But at the same time, I rejoice in the fact that God does not remember my sin anymore. David asked, he said, remember not the sins of my youth. Now, you know what the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 8 and verse number 12, the Bible says, for I will be merciful to their unrighteousness. Boy, you talking about something we can shout about is the fact that God will be merciful to their unrighteousness. Listen, and their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 17, it says, in their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. Now listen, David didn't have the luxury of having the, the scriptures or especially the New Testament like you and I have. And, but he asked God to do something for him that we have recorded in the New Testament in the book of Hebrews that teaches that God does do exactly what David asked God to do, and that is that he doesn't remember our sin anymore. You know, the Bible says, even the prophet Isaiah recorded back in Isaiah 43 and verse 25, he said, I... Even I am he that blotteth out thy transgressions for mine own sake, and I will not remember thy sins. What a tremendous blessing. You and I have the promise of God that when we are born again, when we are saved, when we ask God to save us, that he remembers our sin no more. Friend, if you have, you, you may be uh, down in the dumps. You may be discouraged. You may be defeated. You, you may not have victory over many things in your life, but you ought to take time right now and thank God for that great truth in the Bible that because of our salvation, because the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ has washed away our sin, our God does not remember our sin anymore. Now, come back to our text in Psalm 25, verse 7. It says, remember not the sins of my youth, nor my transgressions. So not only does David want the sins of his youth to not be remembered, but he also doesn't want his transgressions to be remembered. Now, a transgression is going over or beyond the law of God. You say, I don't know about that preacher. Well, let's just look at some scripture to establish the fact. Isaiah chapter 53 and verse number five, the Bible says this. He was wounded for our transgressions. Now, in our terms, we would say that Jesus Christ was wounded 
for our law breaking. I'll, I'll, I'll prove this to you from the New Testament in just a moment. And that is exactly what the Bible teaches in the New Testament. So he was wounded for our transgression. Now, the Bible says in 1 John chapter 3 and verse number 4, the Bible says, Whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law. Now listen, listen, for sin is the transgression of the law. And so this is the Bible definition for transgression. And so when we say that he was wounded for our transgression, we're quoting Isaiah 53, 5. And what we are saying is that Jesus Christ was wounded for our law breaking. Now the Bible says, not the Bible, the 1828 Webster's Dictionary gives this definition for transgression. It says the act of passing over or beyond any law or rule of moral duty. Let me say that again. The 1828 Webster's Dictionary says that a transgression is the act of passing over or beyond any law of rule or moral duty. So we turn in our Bibles now to Exodus chapter number 20, where we have the record of the giving of the Ten Commandments to the nation of Israel. And we'll find there in this giving of the famous Ten Commandments. Now, many in our culture today would say, well, I, I believe that it's important that you keep the Ten Commandments. And it is important, I believe, in our lives that we keep the Ten Commandments, but we don't keep the Ten Commandments to get saved. In fact, those who claim that they are saved by the keeping of the law, you'd be hard-pressed to find one out of a thousand who could even tell you what the Ten Commandments are. If I was, if I was relying on keeping the Ten Commandments to be my Savior, I would certainly commit them to memory and everything that I could think of related to them as well. But here, here's the thing. Let's look and see what it is to transgress, to go beyond, or to violate another's rights, or to attack another's person. The Bible says in Exodus chapter 20, and verse number 1, it says, And God spake all these words, saying, I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Now listen to this first commandment. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. So listen, Islam is a transgression. Buddhism is a transgression. Mormonism is a transgression. The Jehovah's Witness religion is a transgression. Liberal so-called Christianity that denies that Jesus is God is a transgression. Why is that, preacher? Because it is a deliberate attack upon the person of the one true God. Listen, if, if you worship trees or if you worship nature or if you worship yourself, by the way, the majority of idolatry in the world is self-worship. People place themselves before God. They, play, they place their, their ideologies. They, they place their, 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 uh, their way of thinking above what God has to say. They place themselves in God's position. Friend, that is a transgression of the law of God. Listen, if you have, if you have your own God, or if you have your belief that there are many ways to heaven, if you believe that as long as you, uh, as long as a person is sincere, they can worship anything in any way that they want to and still make it to heaven. Listen, friend, you are what the Bible calls in the New Testament, Ephesians chapter two, you are dead in your trespasses and sins. You have violated the person of God. You have attacked who he is. He is the God, the only God. He is the way, the truth, and the life. And no man cometh unto the Father but by him. And so any other way to God, any other way to heaven, other than through and by the Lord Jesus Christ, is a transgression of the law of God. Now, we read on. We read on in the Exodus chapter 20 in the giving of the Ten Commandments. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in earth beneath, that is in the water, under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, 
visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. Listen, here's what God said, not what man said, not what religion said, not what the Baptist said. Here's what God said. God said, when you make a graven image and you bow down to that image, I number you among those that hate me. Did you hear that? It is not innocent religious worship when people worship images and idols. God said those people hate him. They have transgressed the law of God. God said, I drew a line and you disrespected me. You crossed that line. In fact, the first and most important line that God drew, you stepped right over that line and drug God's name through it when you decided that your way was better than God's way, when you decided that any religion is acceptable as long as you're sincere, no, you have transgressed the law of God. Listen, people are doing, in the day that we live, people are doing all kinds of things, claiming to be worshiping God while they're doing them. Listen, I'm doing this to help my worship in God, they often say, and I could mention several things. And yet God said, you're dead in your trespasses and sins. And as a, you're you're just as dead in your trespasses and sins as an adulterer is, or as a mass murderer is. Well, listen, well, we might have crossed that line. Someone else might have crossed a different line, but you also have crossed a line. In fact, you crossed the very first line that God ever drew in the sand by turning to an image or an idol or a statue or a dolly or a crucifix, and you you began worshiping a dead man hanging on a cross around your neck instead of worshiping the true and living God. We, we read on in that extra chapter 20, and I'm getting, I, I'm way behind. I'm going to run out of time. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. You see, it is attack upon his person. It is a violation of his holy and righteous character. Listen, God doesn't want us using his name in some kind of empty, meaningless purpose. I, I, I know that there are People who, who in excitement sometimes they blaspheme God. They, 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 and oftentimes in anger and disappointment, they blaspheme God. Listen, you are crossing, you're taking the name of the Lord in vain. Anytime that you use God's name and you're not using it to call upon him for his help or his care, or you're not using it to praise him for the great God that he is, anytime that you invoke his name in a derogatory manner or in an unjust manner, you are blaspheming the name of God. You're taking his name in vain. You are transgressing the law of God. So stop transgressing. Just stop it already, amen. I'll give you a prime example that people don't like, but OMG, oh my God, that is taking the name of God in vain. You're saying that out of habit. You're saying that not in any way to bring honor and glory to God whatsoever. You are using it in a derogatory manner. You are transgressing the law of God. God drew a line. He said, my name is holy, Stop trashing it, stop abusing it, stop violating it, amen. Now, verse number 12, we read on down in that in that Exodus chapter 20, and I got to hurry. The Bible says, honor thy father and thy mother. And so, you know, a, a transgression is the violation of another's rights. And so if you choose to disrespect your honor and your father, if you choose not to honor your mother and your father, you are disrespecting the law of God. Now, uh, let, let me, I, I need to hurry so I can get on in verse number. Listen, I, I believe that God is a God of order. I, I certainly believe the Bible teaches that God is a God of order. And so I find it amazing that folks proudly proclaim when you witness to them, well, I haven't murdered anybody or I haven't committed adultery. That same crowd thinks nothing of taking God's name in vain or in dishonoring their parents And both of those commandments came before thou shalt not kill and thou shalt not commit adultery. And so listen, friend, may the Lord remember not the sins 
of my youth, nor my transgressions. I got to go. My time is gone. Listen, I, I hope to see you or, or, or hear from you again on our next broadcast. May God bless you until that time. Goodbye. Thank you so much for watching and listening on social media. Please like and share the broadcast so we can reach as many folks as possible. We thank you for that. Goodbye and God bless.